Welcome, I'm Kamla. My guest today is filmmaker Brett Morgan, and we're going to be talking to him about his latest documentary, Jane. It's a film based on Jane Goodall. Day after day, in the sun and the wind and the rain, I climbed into the hills. This was where I was meant to be. Welcome to San Francisco. Thank you. This is a very immersive film and that's one of the hallmarks of your filmmaking. But before we go into the immersive experience, could you highlight and let us know what is 16mm film? Because today we are in a digital world. 16mm film, yes. <clears throat> um, back, in the, uh, back before we started using videotape in the 80s, people used a cinema film. 60 millimeter film, which was uh, which is a lot more difficult to use and operate, and had a lot more problems, but it was more a little more beautiful. And how many? And because it came in raw stock, and you could only shoot X uh, number of minutes per uh, per yeah, can, Yeah, unlike right? unlike video, when Hugo was sh when when they were J Hugo and Jane were shooting in Gombe, um, he was film cost a, a ton of money, and it, he couldn't get more film stock, so he had, every shot was so precious. Okay, so Hugo here is uh, Jane Goodall's first Correct. husband, and uh, he was a very famous photographer, and he was a one-man operation. Yes. And it was his archive that you got to see. Yes. And this had no film notes, nothing, so you were basically left with hours of footage mm. with no notes and no st start, no beginning, and like you had mentioned in interviews, it was very random. Mm. Yeah, it, all the footage was completely scrambled up. The, the one thing I'll say, though, is that um, I had read Jane's book, In the Shadow of Man, which is a seminal book she published in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, and so in many ways, the film became was an adaptation of that. And our job was trying to find shots to help visualize that narrative. And when you decided to do this film, one of the things you said is you want the budget and you want the final cut, both of which you got. And then you got Philip Glass as your mm -hmm. music person. Why did you choose Philip Glass? Well, I wanted the film to feel like a cinematic opera. And if you live in America in the past hundred years and you're thinking about doing an opera, then you start at the, with the best, which is Philip Glass. Um, he also is an icon of documentary film, and he's an icon of classical music. And the idea of taking these two icons together and bringing them bringing them together was was very exciting to me. And in many ways, what I said to Philip is, "You're essentially writing an opera for Jane's life." Mm. So, uh, um, so it was a great opportunity. May I uh, compliment you on the film because this is a film that actually shows us the human being behind that name. We all know her as jo Jane Goodall and the work that she's done for chimpanzees and uh, the wildlife. But I think this is the first time I think many of us got to see how her origin story, Yeah, you know? I think Jane, when you get to know her, there's even more to admire than what... Like what? Well, I, I think her entire being is her... Jane makes the use of every moment she's on this earth. Every second she's here. She does not watch TV. There's no idle time. She is make, she's out there, as you and I are sitting here doing this interview, out trying to save the world. Not for herself. She knows she's in her last days. But for future generations. Jane is... is um, she also you know, went through... A lot of people don't know that she was a mother, that she had a child, that she had to balance her work with her being a mom and all that stuff. And, and so I think the movie is so much more than just what one might expect about a nature film. Talk to us about her husband, and because you call it a love story, but this is not a love story between her and her husband, but it's a love story about her love for her work. Yeah, I think a lot of people, myself included to a certain extent, who've had passions, who've discovered their passions early on in life, it's hard to say that those are our first loves. And that, that love is, is, is 
is strong because for many of us, it got, it's the one constant in our life prior to meeting our, our partners. So when I met my wife, I was 30 years old, but I'd been in a relationship with cinema since I was two. That was your church. Cinema, cinema, was, cinema church. was my church. So I said to my wife, whatever, you know, just so you know, don't try to compete with film. You said Je- that? Yeah, yeah. After two, days, two minutes after we got engaged. <laughs> and, um, and Has she ever tried to compete? Yeah, she wins. She wins. But that's, <laughs> I, I, that's a whole other story. Jane also, you know, from the moment she was, came into this world, she wanted to study animals. So when she met Hugo, who she would eventually marry, she had to, and particularly in the 60s, when women were supposed to give everything up for their husbands, the great Jane Goodall, this amazing conservationist, scientist, gave up her work to go be with her husband on the Serengeti. And a lot of what the movie is about is how she has to learn to reclaim her life and to become whole again. And I think it's very empowering for women in particular because the message is you, you, you don't have to give up your dreams to have a child. We don't see that very often in, in, in media. It's very rare that a woman is allowed to be a good mom and successful at their work. And I think this film really has strikes a chord with certain members of the audience. Was she a good mom? I think that Jane, listen, what Jane talks about in the film is that she did not spend a minute away from her child for the first three years of his life. That's a good mom. Mm. That is being a good and mom. And that she learned from watching the she chimpanzees. She learned from watching the chimpanzees. And she decided to have a child after she had studied the chimps having a child. She wanted, in fact, was going to do a study about the differences between child rearing in, in humans and chimps based on her own child. And you see some of the footage for that in the film. It's kind of amazing. Hmm. So uh, one of the most interesting things as I was watching the film is I didn't know that her mother played such a strong and important role. Uh, and we don't get to hear such stories. No, well, you know, the thing is with uh, Jane's mother is, um, was incredibly supportive. Jane did not have a father in the house. She didn't have brothers around. She was raised in a home with all women. And as such, she was never objectified or uh, treated anything less than, than she than was warranted. And it's interesting because, you know, you talk to a lot of women growing up from different cultures around the world. And we live in such a male-centric society that oftentimes girls are sitting around the dinner table with their brothers and the father dictates all the conversation to the boys, overlooking the girls, questioning their self-worth. You look pretty, that's enough. The lesson of this film for parents is to listen to your children, support them. Don't try to make them in our image, identify with them and just listen. That's what they need to hear, to be supported. And so Van Gate gave, her, gave Jane that, and as a result, you and I are sitting here talking about her today. Yeah, the mother went with her to Africa when Leakey said that she needed to have... Yeah. Uh, well, it wasn't Leakey, it was the Tanzanian government. Oh, okay. And, and it, which wasn't Tanzania at the time, but they... they Tanganyika. In, yeah, exactly, yeah. They insisted on Jane having a chaperone. Yeah. And so... Uh, what a quaint been, term. Chaperone. <laughs> yeah, it was just chaperone. <laughs> it was also, I think, British uh, yeah. colony. Okay, yeah. yeah. Did uh, and you spent some time in Tanzania. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. In the th- so that's the other thing. Why did you want to interview her? Because uh, you had seen this footage and something happened. I think as you were watching the footage and said, "I think I need to talk to her," and she was reluctant to talk to you. Well, it was clear that we couldn't. Um, that that I initially when I brought in Philip Glass, I thought maybe I'll do the film without narration of any sort. And it was clear that we needed context. That was this is because you'd seen the Orson Welles movie and you didn't, you didn't, the one that Jane Goodall's movie. No, I just wanted to make a sort of, I thought it would, I was going to make this art piece using ah. Philip's music and just Jane wandering around nature. But without the context, you don't know what she's doing in there. So we realized we had to interview her. I ended up shooting the entire film first. I mean, editing the entire film first. And then after I did the edit, I went and interviewed her because I needed to know which parts I was looking for. She only wanted to give me a couple hours um, because she's she's a, would rather talk to school kids than myself. Um, but we did a couple days, and it's it's the sort of anchor of the film, and I think audiences are really going to enjoy her candor, mm. her sincerity, and hopefully, 
you know, I, you can hear my voice throughout the film kind of asking the questions I'm assuming the audience is asking in each moment. So how different of an interviewer were you with Jane Goodall? Because the, the, one of the leading questions, the opening question was it depends on the interviewer. Well, how did she open up to you? What, what within you kindled your desire to kind of say, I need to get the answers from her? I'm a perfectionist, and ah. I think Jane identified that. I mean, I did not show up with a two-person crew. We had a 50-person crew 50 uh, person. for an interview like this. And I aimed to get it right, and when I wouldn't get an answer I liked, I would continue to probe, and I think Jane... Jane has no time for fools, but she has a lot of respect for people who do their are homework. who do their work and dedicated to their craft. And I think that she recognized that. And also, I brought Ellen Kiris with me, one of the world's greatest cinematographers. Also, a, a, a pioneer, I hate even saying this, but a legend, a, a legend, particularly as a female pioneer in the world of cinematography. And I think that you know she saw that we brought it in. There was a lot of gravitas. And she knows because she's been in front of a camera for years. Yeah, she's been involved in documentary films longer than no, I've been with alive. her husband does. Yeah, since you know, 19. So. Well, even before that, in 1955, she worked at a production company in London. Oh, okay. So, so uh, being in front of a camera is nothing new for her. She's very comfortable. She, she knows the whole process. She does. She prefers not to, but she understands that she has a certain power. Okay. How did you get her to open up and talk about her private life, which is something that I think many of us don't know anything about uh, that, yeah. that aspect of her life. Um, uh, well, you know, I just, I, I, that was what the film was about, so she had to go there. I think that some of the stuff, it was hard for her memory to, to sort of go there, and I would show her scenes from the film to help jog her memory. Okay, so that's what. So let's get, go back to your own passion for film. You got interested in film as a young kid, and I think by the age of three or four or five, you were going to cinema by yourself and yeah. you watch films. And then you majored in uh, mythology and history. Yeah. From a very interesting school, Hampshire College, yep. which uh, Ken Burns is mm -hmm. uh, an alum, and then there is, uh, who else is an alum? John Cracker. Uh, yes, Cracker. the uh, Le Liev Schreiber. Liev Schreiber, yeah, yeah, he was there when <laughs> I was there, yeah, yeah. Oh, he was there. Yeah, yeah. And then you went to a school in uh, Santa Monica where you had... Uh, Jack Black, Jack my Black. classmate, yeah. yeah. So you had this very interesting upbringing yourself. Yeah. Uh, why did you study mythology? Uh, well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. No one's ever asked me that. Um, because you quote John Campbell's note in the production notes for Jane. Yeah, you know, because the um, uh, film is, is modern-day mythology. You know, I, I, was, I was particularly fascinated with John Ford when I was younger. Mm. And John Ford's films are myths, American Foundation myths. I mean, he basically goes through the history of America from the founding of the country to through the 1960s. Now, it is the dominant culture's story of America. As a Jew, I was not part of this fabric. Um, you were not part of this fabric. But as an anthropologist, I understand that cultures need myths to help define them. You need to celebrate. Right. Now, what's challenging in our culture, in our multifaceted culture, in our multicultural culture, is how we can find myths to unite all of us. Because that's what we need as a, as a, we can see how divided our country is right now. You know, and I, I do think of Jane as someone who crosses political lines. Mm. I think she's apolitical. And I think she is one of the few sort of cultural icons that can unite people from all sides of, of the aisle. She's not a feminist, even though I think she is, but she doesn't like the, 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 the she doesn't like the tag. She's... Did you ever ask her about it? Yeah, she's just she's from a different world. She's more traditional than that. She's, uh, um, maybe but she's all about empowering women. Yeah, maybe she belongs to that category of people who think it doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman, I, as I think long it's, as you I think, do it. Exactly. I think there's something kind of empowering about maybe Jane's approach. Maybe it's postmodern, right? post-evolutionary. Exactly. Exactly. Um, she's you know very religious, but she's an evolutionary biologist. She's very religious. Very religious. Very religious. That part that didn't come through in the film. Oh yes, sure. Well, I, I hope it did. Her spirituality. Spirituality, yes. Yeah, but see, not Jane, the... Jane, Jane's not dogmatic, so she borrows from all religions. So she's that's as, the key word, dogmatic. Yes, she's she as much a Buddhist Jews. as she is, uh, a, 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 you know, a Christian. You know. Is that why you chose Philip Glass? Because he's also not dogmatic. He describes himself as a Taoist, Buddhist, Hindu, no. Jew. <laughs> no, but but it's interesting. They're very similar, those two. 
the, yeah, the, I'd that, like to hook them up. Uh, Philip's married, unfortunately, but it would be, no, no, it's not a question. Who? <laughs> how I'm, great would it be if Philip and Jane? <laughs> I, I, all due respect to Philip's wife, but how great would it be if Philip and Jane came together for this? <laughs> so anyway, why did you study mythology? That was the question. Because uh, you wanted to find yeah, a place for yourself. Here, here, I'll tell you why. Because I went to a junior high and high school that it, that had a cinema studies program. Yes. All right. I knew that if I went to undergraduate school for film, I was going to become a filmmaker with a high school education. I absolutely discourage and think it should be illegal for anyone to study film as an undergraduate. Can I interrupt you for a minute? Because yeah. the teacher who taught you also taught at AFI. That was my junior mm -hmm. high school teacher. Did he tell you that you needed to go and get a degree in something else before going no. to film? No. That was just, I knew intuitively that I would go to graduate school for film, but that I needed to have a, a grounding. A, a grounding. And so I went to this place, Hampshire College, where you design your own curriculum. It's an alternative college. Alternative pro program. So I basically designed a curriculum on my own that I thought, this is what a director needs to know. Shakespeare, mythology. Um, history. History, uh, more Shakespeare. No economics. No, no economics, no science. <laughs> the science might have helped me. Um, math might have helped me as well. But, so you uh, took a liberal arts approach. I took a very, very, very sculpted liberal arts approach. Sculpted and, is key. And my thesis was called John Ford and the Myth of American Civilization. Oh. Now, Hampshire in the 80s was the height of political correctness. John Ford was, was, was Satan in that environment. Oh, was he? Well, yeah, because, I mean, he's a, you know, there's a, there's a there's, John, John Ford represented the white ruling class. And, but I would argue that there was still value in John's films, even though they, they didn't include me in their mythology. But I could, again, it's what I was saying, I could appreciate their value at, in the culture at the time they were made and why they served a, a purpose. And so I like to think of my films in many ways as like kind of, I mean, they're all, when you make a film, particularly on these subjects, who you're not doing the definitive film. I'm not doing the definitive film on Kurt. I'm not doing the definitive film on Jane. These subjects are going to be told for eons of time. These are, these people But people are going time. to go and watch the two hour documentary. No, only, for, only for a couple generations. You know, like, my film will be the Kurt Cobain film perhaps for the next 15 years, in 20 years. And then another generation will do their story. And when they do their story, they're going to do something totally different because what they, they're going to have a different need for Kurt than we did. When we did our Kurt film, it was very important to try to express and allow other people who suffer from some of the mental illness that Kurt suffered from to feel that they're not alone. So you're doing what John Ford did, but in a whole different, uh, from a whole different angle. Because uh, you call, well, you no, call because John Ford was exclusionary, and I don't. No, but, you're not exclusionary. I'm, That's I, why I said you're inclusionary. You're uh, I, I, well, inclusive. Well, I'm I'm aware of the culture we're in, and I feel like Jane is the perfect antidote for our times. I feel like this is the movie that needs to be heard and seen now, particularly because of what's happening with gender politics in America today, and I feel that this story is not preachy. I can go make a documentary about gender politics, and it's going to be seen by the, the converted already. But Jane is not a preachy film. It was not intended to have a message, but the culture has taken ownership of it and have told us what the message is. Mm. And they've told us that this has now become a film about a woman who does not have to give up her dream to have a family, to have a child. It is a movie about passion. And it is, it is, it, it, it's, it's, it, it's, 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 transcends the, the time and the science and all of that to just become this kind of rare movie that you can go to and feel good about and, and smile. But, you know, how many times do we smile at a non-Disney film where the what's on screen isn't, isn't terribly offensive? You know what I mean? It's like, this is a, a, a total anomaly. We saw this weekend, the movie sold out almost every show we had in L.A. this weekend. Mm. It went from five years old to 80 years old. I mean, it was an amazing thing to, 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 to witness. So you had a whole cross-section of people that came to see the film. A whole cross-section. And, you know, going back to your, to your point, I think, that, um, <clears throat> I think that these stories like the Chicago 10 or Kurt Cobain or the Rolling Stones, Bob Evans. I was going to Evans, come to Chicago 10. <laughs> Bob Evans or Jane Goodall. These are stories like Richard III. Mm. You know, like every generation for the last 500 years have, have produced Romeo and Juliet, and their staging of it 
is a reflection of the time that they're putting it together. We all see something. What I what I see in this footage is so filtered through my life experiences, so that the idea that Jane, her first this is a love story between a woman and a work. That's not a film that this person is going to make. That's a film that I make because that is specific to my experience, you see. So I often say all film, not just documentary. Are, any film that takes place in the past is never about the past. They're always about the moment that they're being told. Chinatown is not about the 30s and the 40s. It's about, 19, it's about the 1970s, you know? The name is misleading. Yeah. So, uh, so I, think, um, I think all film has documentary merit to it, uh, anthropological merit to it. Sometimes it takes a little distance to it. So now we can look back at the films of the 80s, right? I grew up in the 80s. You can now look back at the films of the 80s as anthropological documents that not only show us what people looked and wore, but what the myths were, what the prevailing myths of that day was. You see what I'm saying? And so those Hollywood films like, like uh, uh, The Breakfast Club have as much ethnographic DNA as any documentary made in the 80s. Yeah, The Breakfast Club molded a, a whole generation yeah. and more. Okay, yeah. uh, let me just ask you, what, what do you think is the role of mythology in today's society? Do we even know the role that it plays? Well, it's, 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 listen, we have this whole thing right now in America, obviously with fake news, right? Fake news, fake news, fake news. I mean, it's so troubling mm. that, that somehow uh, the president has used his office to make us question, uh, I mean, maybe it's not a bad thing. Maybe people should question their news sources. Um, but I don't, you know, we need to find areas of agreement. Mm. You know, we have to find common ground. We have to ask ourselves, listen, they may be that, and we, 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 we it's hard to imagine where we all share a country. We do a share a country. So we have got to find common ground there has to be some things that we can meet in the middle on and from there to create myths that help unite us as a, as a people. You know, movies do it. Star Wars did it. Star Wars is one of the great myths of, of the, the 20th century. And when, when the new Star Wars film opens in December 15th, that is going to bring the whole country together. Everybody, uh, from regardless, a, of, regardless of your ethnic background or your politics, everyone will show up in that theater. And that's a powerful thing. Hmm. That's a powerful thing. How are you bringing up your kids? You have daughters? I have a daughter and two boys, yeah. Okay, so when you are at the dinner table, what do you ask your daughter? Well, you know, see, now the thing with a movie like Jane, it's as important for boys to see this film yeah. as girls. I, when I started to make the film, I thought I was making for my daughter, which mm -hmm. is a very um, um, chauvinistic uh, attitude. Or exclusionary. It is. It is critical. I think we all know, this is not a political statement, that women should be running this world. We all know that. We all agree that anyone who was born in any house in the world, I don't care what country you were born in, knows that the mother was the one who took care of us. So why we live in a society where we then have men trying to take care of us is just idiotic. <laughs> but but I, I, anyways, I, I, I try to, uh, so I, I, at home I try not to distinguish because she's a girl and the, the, the boys. But when I made the film, I, I thought it was making for my daughter. And then, I, yeah, then I realized, I'm like, no, it's for the boys as is, is, is much, if not more so. Mm. And, um, you know, I just try to teach my daughter self-respect, the same, same thing that I'm sure you do and that, that all of us do, which is, you know. <laughs> um, but, uh, and, you know, listen, I think it's hard because I think when people see Jane Goodall and they see Philip Glass or they hear me talk, and all of us found our thing when we were really young. And I think that's really scary to, to kids today because not everybody finds their thing. We're, listen, we're all moving at our own speed. You know, I remember, I, even though I wanted to do film before I could speak, when I got to NYU, there were kids who had never made a film before. Steve McQueen was in my class. He did oh. 12 Years a Slave. Okay. Steve McQueen had never picked up a camera in his life. Steve McQueen made the best film in our class, his first, his first effort. Why? Well, because he's a genius. <laughs> But, no, but, but, but that's the, an easy answer. He's a genius. Why? Because it obviously irked you, or uh, it, 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 you noted the fact that he had not made a film. But what I was going to say is, it doesn't like 
everybody moves at their own speed. Okay. And just because I said when I was four that I was going to be a director doesn't mean I'm going I'm, to. I have the right to be a director. I felt a sense of entitlement when I got to NYU. Like I wanted this more than any of you. But the truth was, there were plenty of people who had never done it before, who just had turned to film at 23 or 24 years old, and just kicked ass and made amazing films. And so. I just think for young people, if they don't find that passion, I think as parents, we need to try to encourage them. But if they don't find it, they should not feel overwhelmed that like, I, if I haven't found it at 14, my God, what am I gonna do with my life? No, there's plenty of time. You, could, you can shift and move. At, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm almost 50 and I'm starting to see possibly doing other things with my life now that, that I never thought of before. So I, I, I think that there's, yeah. Are you, are you gonna be making a feature film? I just did a I did a show for Marvel this year. No, I, I don't like that. Um, I'm I'm not that keen. To, I, but I, I I'm I'm into arcades. So yes, I I, I, I like read pinball. that you were in Chicago and that you went right yeah, after that. Yeah, I like pinball. So I actually, honestly, <laughs> I've been contemplating <laughs> possibly giving up my film career to set up like a vintage arcade. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Where? In Hawaii. What a place! Does that sound like the craziest? Like, no. am I like, is it, T Tiff you is like over be, there going, no, no, but it's, it's for real. No, you want to be a lotus eater. You want to be in the most I, beautiful I, island. I live, I live ha part of the year in the least touristy place in all of the Hawaiian islands, which I'm not going to say because I don't want anyone to I go there. I know where you are, okay. Kauai. No, well, no, I'm on the big island in a place near Waipio Valley. <laughs> I just shared it with the world. But, but the thing I love about it is like, nobody knows what I do. Nobody cares what I do. And, um, and you surf? No, I just watch clouds. I like to watch They're the clouds. They're beautiful. It's, you know what? It's, it's the experience of making Jane. Uh, there is a moment, going back to why, why this film why, right now, there is a moment um, during the production where I got very sick. I had some ser very serious health issues. I'm very serious. And I had to take a couple months off, and I, I went to Hawaii. And, and for several months, I literally would wake up at, at 3 in the morning and watch clouds all day. And the coconut trees. Yeah. And I would watch the clouds, and I realized that it, without the experience of making Jane, I would have never been able to tap into that serenity. Are you that, okay now? Yeah, I'm okay now. Um, but it was, it, was a, it, was a, you know, it was a gift that this film came to me when it did. And how was uh, Tanzania? You know, I, it's, it's not fair for me to even comment because we were so focused on shooting our, our thing. Gombe, where we saw the chimpanzees, was, I mean, I, every person on the planet should be fortunate enough to have that experience with the chimp. Now, I will say, to a certain extent, if you can't make it there, the film's just about as good because we use long lenses so you can get close up to the chimps in the way you can when you're there with your naked eye. And we kind of speed up some of the action so it's a little more dramatic than just sitting there watching the meat all day. Um, but uh, it's amazing, you know, what Jane's done there. You know, it's, it, it's, she got Gombe to become this state park and it's, these chimpanzees are thriving. So are you happy you made the film? Oh, it's the best thing I ever did. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And what did your wife say? She thinks this, this is the most important film I've made, the best film I've made. Um, it's the most soul, soulful film I've made, and it, it, make, it gives me tremendous pride to go out and promote this film. Just tremendous pride to, because it's like we're spreading, we're bringing smiles across the country. I mean, we're watching people have a joyful experience at the cinema, and also an artful experience at the same time, which is not a common thing. It's hard to get art and joy. And also show the uh, role of a mother. Yeah, exactly. So thank you so much My for pleasure. doing the interview and best of luck with the film and whatever your next project is. Thank you so much. Thank you. And if you missed any of our shows, you can watch them on our YouTube channel. We'll be back again next week with another edition of our show. Until then, goodbye.